You are now listening to the Performance Physical Therapy Better Faster Podcast. Today's host is Dr. Michelle Colley, CEO of Performance Physical Therapy. Today's guest is Dr. Brian Hay, Community and Athletic Development Officer at Performance Physical Therapy. Well, here I am. I am here for our COVID series of our podcast. And today I'm lucky enough to be joined by my colleague and physical therapist, Dr. Brian Hay, who's not only a physical therapist, but he's also a specialist in the game of golf. Clinically, I don't know about professionally what his game of golf is like, but um, we'll say he's as good as he can be, given the fact that he's a dad. And with Father's Day just around the corner, I'm sure there's nothing he'd like more than a game of golf. So welcome, Brian. Thank you for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, a specialist on the golf course, it is a big stretch for describing me, but I enjoy it. It's good to be out there. And yeah, hoping to get out there this Father's Day weekend at some point too. That's great. Well, there's not many golfers that can say they are specialists and are professionals at it. Um, golf is a really challenging game. So it's it's one of those games that you can never be perfect at. And um little frustration involved there, but let's start with um, looking at your general knowledge or thinking about the game of golf. It's an interesting game because it can be played by anyone all around the world. So let's look at America to start with. In the year 2019, how many people do you believe played golf in the year 2019 in the U.S.? In the U.S., 70 million. Which when you say 70 million to me, it, it's mind blogging. So I'm like, that's a lot of people. So you're a little, you obviously um, love golf a little more than I do. So it's actually 34.2 million. Uh, um, so a little less than that, 24, 24 million actually played rounds of golf. And then there's another almost 10 million that are going to um, driving ranges and playing mini golf and other sort of forms of golf. What would you have been? My guess, well, because I'm from this little country of New Zealand, I would have been like three million. Um, so good question. Um, I guess then when you think about America as a whole, thinking about 10% of the country playing seems actually like a realistic number, which I think is around 34 million. It'd be interesting to see how that uh, percentage holds up in other countries where golf is pretty popular as well, too, if that's kind of an average percentage. Absolutely. I'll Google that after this. <laughs> All right, get some homework. <laughs> My next question, of those people who played golf, what is the average number of rounds of golf that you believe that they played? Uh, I'm going to go 10 rounds. Okay. Well, that one, you're on the lower side. It's actually 18.2 rounds. So the goal, average golfer plays 18 rounds a year, which – I think is a good number. It is a good number. Yeah, I would love to be able to play 18 rounds a year. Uh, <laughs> but up here, you know, in the, in the Northeast, we have a short season and it's it's hard to find that time. But uh, I'm envious of those who get out 18 times a year. So how about the number of men and women? What percentage of men do you think play golf compared to women? Well, that's a good question. Um and I think that's shifting a little bit. I think it's creating more of a balance. Mm -hmm. I'd probably say maybe 70, 30 men to, to women. Yep. Well, you're close. We're still at 77% men. So it's definitely still a male dominated sport, but obviously we're all aware that there are more and more women playing. And here's a stat I found really interesting. The highest number of golfers, what's the age range? How old are people who play golf? Oh, you know, I feel like when, when you get a little more time and you're retired, you start to find a little more time for golf. So I'm going to say somewhere, you know, between 50 and 70 years old. And now maybe those are the people who are playing 18 or 30 rounds a year because they have a little more time. And I hope that's what they are doing. But actually the highest number of golfers, over 6 million are between the ages of 18 and 34. So oh. definitely becoming a more popular sport with the younger crew. Yeah, I'm sure that's positive for, uh, you know, the, the PGA out there and how they look at the growth of their sport. And I'm sure a lot of that's been driven by many of the icons that you see out there and, and the pro golfers right now. You know, mm -hmm. Tiger Woods created a, a revolution when it came to golf and interest for, for younger athletes um, and certainly sparked the interest. But now you look on tour, a lot of these 
the, the golfers you see out there, it's a shift. These are, these are truly professional athletes. These are guys that put a lot of time, not just into their golf game, but their overall fitness. Um, so it's, it's not just a golf specific. It's really drawing the overall athletes as well. And you see it out there every weekend with the fitness level of these golfers uh, and their skill that they have. Yeah. And the age. It seems to be the, the better golfers are much younger than the better golfers were when I was growing up. Well, I think what you bring up is an interesting point, that people don't just play golf for a pastime, for something to do. They truly are putting the time into being as strong, as flexible, as fit as possible so they can actually perform at the most elite level. So it's not just a pastime. It truly is a sport. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we still obviously see lots of golfers who are injured and not that anyone ever wants to talk about injury. People tend to want to say, well, how do I get the best score or the least score as it comes to in golf? And um, and you can only perform at your best if you do stay healthy and you are not injured. So let's talk about some of the most, some of the common reasons. Why do golfers get injured? Why are they limited in how much they can play? So if I asked you that, Brian, as a physical therapist, what do you think the number one reason why why golfers become injured? Uh, well, I'll say that it's the only sport I've ever played where someone drives around and offers you drinks during your, your <laughs> round. So maybe that's a little <laughs> bit of it. Uh, but I also think it's a really approachable sport. You know, you don't have to be a, a certain fitness level to go out there and play. It's, it's really open to people of really various fitness levels, um, which are there's pros and cons to that. The pro is it, it allows a lot of people to get out there, get active. Um, unlike a sport, you know, like like basketball, you know, it's going to be hard for someone if they don't at least have a bare minimum fitness level to, to go out and play a whole game of basketball or to be able to go out there and, you know, play a throw on some skates and play hockey. It's a really approachable sport. So I think part of what you sacrifice when your sport's approachable is, you know, a minimum, a decrease in the bar of fitness. And I think that creates a lot of uh, injuries. I also think a big part of it is as easy as the game looks, it's a really technical game that involves a, a lot of moving parts, a lot of multiple joints, a lot of force. Um, and if your mechanics aren't dialed in and aren't as specific as they can be, you know, you're, you're setting yourself up to, to put yourself at higher risk for injury. And I think that's why we do see a fair amount of, you know, low back injuries, shoulder injuries, amongst golfers is there's still a lot that we could do to set ourselves up to be in a better position for that. Mm -hmm. So what would be some tips that you would tell someone if they were either returning to golf um, after a a quarantine or a cold winter and said, all right, I'm going to get back on the golf course or someone who's never played before. Are there specific recommendations that you would provide them or tell them to minimize their risk of one of these overuse injuries or one of these common complaints? Yeah. I mean, the most important thing we can do is you know, make sure we're getting a good warm up. A lot of times I see it on, on the golf course all the time. People showing up a little bit late for their tea time, not giving themselves plenty of time to prepare. They get up to that first tea box and, you know, they're asking their body to create this massive range of motion which it just hasn't done. It's just been sitting in the car for 30 minutes or so. So taking your, taking the time, get to the course a little early, five, 10 minutes earlier um, than even you plan to be there for your tea time. So often that could be maybe 20 minutes before your tea time and spend five, 10 minutes getting in a stretch. If you have access to get onto the driving range, stretch a little bit, warm up, go hit some balls on the driving range. You're really priming your system to get out there and play. And also it's going to get rid of the likelihood of those first hole shanks or kind of those things that, you know, throw off your swing because your body isn't loosened up and it's not in a proper position to be creating the motion that you're asking it to. Um, Also for beginner golfers, I encourage them, yes, obviously have a warm up, try and increase your fitness level the best you can really work on your hip rotation and thoracic mobility. I'm sure we can dive into the details of that a little bit later. But I also really encourage them to spend some time getting a lesson with a golf pro uh, because they can really help you develop good mechanics. Those mechanics are going to what 
those mechanics are going to allow you to utilize your body the best you can and the most efficiently you can to get the best impact on your swing, out of your swing. And as you said earlier, Michelle, like a lot more people are more concerned with lowering their score than lowering their risk of injury. But I would say you can really do both at the same time. And if you do both at the same time, you're just going to have a, uh, a better outcome in the long run. So spend some time. It's, it's an investment and most people don't want to do that or they're pressed for time and they don't want to spend their time getting a lesson. They'd rather be out there golfing, but it'll pay dividends in the end. So I'll put in a plug for all the golf pros out there that it's well worth the investment and the time, both for your health and the quality of your game to spend some time on the golf pro. I'll actually reiterate that point, Brian. I, there's, lots of sports where yes you can get coaching and you can get advice and you can get help and we're a proponent of many of those but I think golf it goes without saying that the golf swing is such a complicated motion and there are so many opportunities to do it incorrectly and if you're going to repeat a motion over and over again if you're not doing the motion correctly, you're going to end up with overuse and creating pain and dysfunction. And if you've got into a habit of moving a certain way, it's very hard to change it. So I completely agree. A golf pro is an extremely important person to speak to and get a lesson from and they can see what you're doing your buddy can't look at you and say oh dude you're not moving your hips right you know you can't you don't know it yourself when you're swinging the incorrect way a golf pro is trained to look at the kinetic chain and and looking at that rotation from the tip of your head right down to your tip of your toes there's a lot of rotation going on. And if it's not happening in the right combination, in the right way, in the right order, in the right joints, you're setting you up, up for a very high golf score, which is what we don't want. And you're also increasing your risk of pain and injury. Yeah, I think you, you hit a valuable point there, Michelle, where you talk about, um, you know, the kinetic chain. And that's kind of as a physical therapist where, where I live all day when working with patients. And so many folks I see, as I mentioned before, they have low back or rotator cuff injuries. And often it becomes, I talk to people, it's, it's a victim culprit situation where, yeah, your low back is injured and you have some pain in your lower back, but maybe the lower back isn't the problem. The way our bodies is designed is, I often tell people, it's this every other joint, uh, compromise. So one joint. So if you go down the line, our neck's designed to be really um, stable. Our mid-back wants to be really mobile, our lower back stable, our hips mobile, knee stable, ankle mobile. Now, there has to be a balance between that stability and mobility. So let's use the lower back, for example, where we're designed to want to be stable in that area. If we're not getting enough motion from our thoracic spine, it's going to create problems in our lower back. So the victim becomes a lower back, but the culprit is really this lack of mobility in our thoracic spine or our mid back. And you see that all the time where, you know, with patients, Often we think low back pain, strength and core, strength and core, strength and core. And the whole idea of strengthening, right, is this idea of we're preparing that tissue to be able to tolerate stress. Whenever we strengthen, that's our goal. But what if we looked at it the other way is, yes, we want to be able to put the core in a strong place so it can tolerate stress. But what if we can look at areas around there that will result in reducing stress on that area? So now we can have a strong core and be stable in that area, but also get mobility from areas above and below. So we're gonna reduce the requirements of that tissue on that lower back. And I see plenty of folks in the clinic all the time that are like, I'm doing planks, I'm doing all my core work, but I still got this back pain. Well, all right, let's look at some other factors. Let's reduce stress on your lower back. And how can we do that? Let's get some mobility above it. Let's get your mid back moving a little bit better. Let's get your hips moving a little bit better. Let's ask your lower back to do a little bit less. Uh, and particularly with the golf swing, so much of it, such a rotational movement. So, so much of that rotation comes from our mid backs, our hips. And if they're not prepared to provide that rotation, we're going to ask an area that really doesn't want to provide rotation to help us get some of that. And that's how we end up with these overuse injuries most of the time. No, oh, you just did a perfect job of describing all of that. Great job. I, I think the other thing you bring up, I think when people don't know the human body as well, they look at it and think, well, of course the rotation happens from your neck and your lumbar spine. You know, why would your hips move that much? You've got a pelvis there. Why does that mid part of your back move so much? There's ribs there. 
but they have those support structures in place because they're supposed to rotate. And because we spend half our day sitting or sitting in a computer or driving, we don't have the, um, we don't give our body the chance to do those rotation motions in those parts of the body. So that warm up and that making that effort to maximize your rotation in your hips and your um, thoracic spine can ultimately minimize and decrease the stress that's going on in your lumbar spine, in your neck, your shoulders, and your knees. Which, which you don't really hear of people playing golf who suddenly have major problems with their thoracic spine. And you may hear it a little bit with the hip. There's usually an, another underlying reason. The main areas that are problems are the rotator cuff, back pain, um, and the knees, of course, because we're trying to put too much rotation in those areas. Yeah. You see it all the time. You know, if someone go to the driving range and maybe they hit 100 balls at the driving range, you know, the next day they get up and their their back sore. And maybe it's just a muscle soreness because they... they you know, they hit a bunch of balls and they work those muscles. But to me, that's a yellow flag that you're overstressing your lower back. Like it's not prepared to take the load you're asking it to do. And yeah, maybe you got away with it this time, but it's only a matter of time before you get to that point. Um, and that's where it's really looking at how well your body's moving to set yourself up for success. And then how well your swing is coordinated to set yourself up for success. So, so far we've got, you need to get, you should get a lesson. You need to make sure you've got the biomechanics right. You need to warm up, take the time to warm up, prepare your body. You need to think about the mobility through your thoracic spine, through your hips, especially. Um, we, we often hear obviously of, of hand, wrist, elbow injuries, golfers' elbows. Let's talk about those areas a little bit. Why are, do those areas get injured and, and what can someone do to minimize the risk of problems to those areas? Yeah, in those areas, um, you definitely see injuries, particularly elbow, shoulder, um, and well, I guess elbow, shoulder, and wrist, you do see in golfers. So a lot would be, you know, that's, there tend to be more muscular injuries and overuse injuries. So I would question posture. I would question a lot in those cases, preparation, because my guess is in those scenarios, a lot of times the, the tissue just isn't getting a good blood supply. It's not healing well. We suddenly ask it to do a, a, a massive amount of stress and it's just not ready. So those are areas where a good warm up is, is certainly critical for that. And then also looking at, again, tolerating stress. And that can come with having a good resistant program. So some type of upper body strengthening. Uh, is going to be critical to integrate there because yeah. the stronger we are through those areas, uh, the more support we're going to get around the joints. Yeah. And you bring up a point about the inflammation and, and, and the overuse is sometimes with your golfer's tennis elbows, if you truly have inflammation in that tendon, which typically doesn't have a great blood supply, if there's swelling there, you're not going to be able to work through it. You are going to have to utilize ice or anti-inflammatories or a strap or look at your grip. You can't just fight through it you're, because you're just going to cause more damage to that tissue. It's something that you really do have to listen to it and not just think, oh, I've, I've, I'm just a little sore from playing golf. You do need to be aware of it because it'll just get worse. Yeah, that's, you're exactly right. And that, that idea of the inflammation and an important concept to remember is, you know, whatever we're strengthening or whatever we're doing in activity, you know, we're actually causing micro trauma to those muscles. So whether it's a positive strength and exercise when we go to the gym or we do something that we're trying to build muscle, we're causing a breakdown in the muscle. Now, what happens is once we cause this breakdown, you know, our body recognizes, okay, when I did this activity, it caused my muscles to have small tears in it. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to repair those tears, but then I'm going to build more muscle on top of that. So the next time I have to do that, I'm more prepared for it. And that's how we build strength. But I think a lot of times what we see with injuries, as you mentioned, you know, the overuse, and that's a huge part of it. But the, it's the balance between overuse. But what I often see in many people is it's not just overuse, it's under recovery. Right. So you get that person that goes to the driving range or they go out and play around at golf and, you know, they hit 100 balls and their, their back sore, or their shoulder sore, or their elbow sore. Now, what do they do rather than give the appropriate amount of time? Because maybe it just is a muscular fatigue from being used rather than give the muscle a proper chance to rest and recover. They're out there the next day. 
And now that micro trauma that we caused day one becomes a little exaggerated rather than healed on day two. And it kind of feeds into that. So we talk about overuse, which is a huge problem, but I also challenge people a lot of times that that's caused by an under recovery. So it's often creating that balance between use and recovery to really be successful. So I shouldn't take out the game of golf and expect to play every single day and um, get a go round and a, a par level. If that's, I might have used the wrong terminology there, but. <laughs> Well, I mean, it depends, right? It depends on your fitness level. You may be able to go out and do that, um, but you got to listen to your body and how it responds. Yeah. So if you go out and you play and you feel great the next day, yeah, go out and play again. If you go out and play and your your body's sore, your knees are achy or your ankles hurt, or your hips are sore, you got to give yourself time to, to recover from that. Pushing through you know, has its time and place, but I would argue that that's probably not the time and place, that that soreness is a message to your brain that, Tissues are trying to adapt and it needs that time to adapt. Now, I know there's probably still some people listening that are kind of concerned or unsure. Should I go to a golf course now? Is this a safe place for, for me to be? And I realize that all the golf courses are open. Um, any particular advice that you have for golfers and, and their thoughts of should I be out on the golf course and what are my risks for COVID um, either spreading it or having um, – um, being exposed to it? Yeah, I mean, it'd be the same advice I would give anybody else, uh, or not anybody else, but give people in any situation. You know, if, if you're going out, be smart. Try and maintain your social distance. Uh, make sure you're you know, doing good hand washing techniques or using good hand washing techniques. Have some hand sanitizer with you. Uh, minimize your interactions and, and close spaces with crowds. So can you go out and play a round of golf? Absolutely. I think you can even go out with a you know, group of three other golfers. Just maintain your social distance. Be smart. Minimize how much um, you know, physical interaction that's happening. I know most golf courses in Rhode Island right now, um, you know, they, they have a ring around the hole. They're not pulling the flag sticks out. So they're trying to create an environment where that's minimized. If you can't maintain that social sort of distancing, you know, if you're going to be in the cart with someone that maybe you don't know, you know, wear your mask, be smart about it. You know, if you're someone who is uh, in a higher risk category, I would encourage you to really kind of weigh the pros and cons of get out there, getting out there and playing golf is versus, you know, your overall health. So it's no different than the same advice I would give someone if they said, hey, do you think I should go to the supermarket or not? Absolutely. And I think the key thing too is realize that all the golf courses are very aware of what's going on. So they're taking the appropriate precautions. So following the, the rules and things that they put in place, they're certainly not just opening up and saying it's a free for all by any means. Absolutely. But it's a wonderful way to get outside um, and get a walk in, even if you are taking a cart, but um, to get some exercise and I do hope that as many people, especially the fathers out there, can get out on Sunday and enjoy a pleasant round of golf because I'm sure you're all well deserving it after everything that's been going on um, during the COVID pandemic. So Brian, have you had a chance to get out and play a round of golf yet this season? I have played, uh, I've only played nine holes so far this this year. Okay, well, I hope on your Father's Day, Brian's a... Um, working physical therapist uh, as well as a dad um, and he's got his own dad so there'll be lots of Father's Day celebrations so my um, best to you this Sunday as well as all the other dads out there so thank you very much Brian. Oh thanks for having us it's great Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Performance Physical Therapy Better Faster Podcast.